Bienvenue to us. Welcome to Reporters here on France 24. Russia has begun to venture to open up vast areas of the east of the country. Already large numbers of tourists have flocked to discover breathtaking landscapes and wildlife. The distance from the big cities perhaps explaining why this area has remained unspoilt until now. But now developing the economy of the region is very much a priority for Russia's president, Vladimir Putin. Elena Volashin is our reporter who's been there. Tell us more, Elena, about why this is so important to Vladimir Putin. Actually, this is the priority of Vladimir Putin because uh, abroad he has set up an image for Russia for several years now of a very great, powerful country, not an emerging one. But uh, the fact that this very vast area east at the country is underdeveloped, is not serving his goals and his ambitions. And so now he has launched the conquest, we can say so, of the Far East, and we will see that it's really not an easy one. Elena Volochin, thank you very much indeed. Stay with us. Let's go now take a look at Elena's report on Russia's Far East. The volcanic landscape of Kamchatka in the far, far east of Russia. Virgin territory, barely touched by tourism. But a few years ago, Vityaz Travel started bringing groups by helicopter to admire the peninsula's scenic highlights and fauna. Here, this is the area of the bears. You have to keep the group all the time. Now we are uh, in the south of Kamchatka. This is a specially protected area and people, uh, they want to visit this area because um, around 1,000 bears live around this lake. Three bears, four bears, three. <laughs> These tourists have traveled from China, Korea, the Czech Republic and even Brazil to see the bears of Lake Kuril up close. We caught a fish. Yeah. We caught a fish. Which one? Uh, the right one. It's so lovely. I have only saw bears in the zoo, not in a wide area. To see the bears in the wild, Yuan Yuan and her colleague Sheng Wei, both from Shanghai, paid 600 euros each for the one-day helicopter trip. They say it was worth every cent. We posted a lot of pictures on WeChat and a lot of friends saw the pictures and they want to try to come here next summer. I am sure more and more Chinese uh, tourists will come. I think local markets should be prepared. Could Kamchatka be the world's next tourist hotspot? That's one part of Vladimir Putin's grand plan to make use of the 41% of Russian territory that's home to only 6% of its population, the Far East. A federal district that the Russian president has now expanded to include two additional regions whilst moving its capital to Vladivostok. Since 2015, one of the highlights of the year here has been the annual Eastern Economic Forum. Daniel Polovinka, deputy director of the Far East Investment and Export Agency, is a busy man. Right now, in a short space of time, we have to get signatures on 50 important contracts with top state officials present. Chasing investors is Daniel and his team's job. Their task is to ensure that every ruble of public money spent on the Far East brings in 10 rubles in private investment. 3.4 trillion rubles worth of contracts. We've been preparing for this all year and now we're signing. Hence a good deal of ceremonial pomp. 
Уважаемые дамы и господа, приветствую вас на церемонии подписания крупнейших соглашений Пятого Восточного экономического форума. There's a certain kind of investor in Russia and in the world who's prepared to work under the conditions we have here in the Far East and deal with the difficulties. We have a remote environment, low population density, insufficient roads and infrastructure, but projects here can really pay off. Investors of this category are active in Russia, Canada, Australia and New Zealand and feel good in these kinds of places. Two hundred and seventy contracts with a total value of forty seven billion euros. For the Russian agencies charged with promoting the Far East, it's a success. But a signature on a piece of paper does not necessarily mean the investment will materialize. Most of these are framework contracts, non binding for the investors. The forum is about projecting an image more than anything else. Ladies and gentlemen, we have set grand goals for the development of the Far East, and these big and important goals can only be achieved through partnerships and collective efforts. The businessmen still have to be persuaded to follow through. This is what Roman Semensov has come to Kamchatka for. He's on his way to meet the representative of a Chinese investor who wants to build a resort here. I've come here to discuss the next steps with the project's director. Our aim is to increase the share of tourism and GDP, and in the Kamchatka region's income specifically, up to a respectable level. Well, look at this place. This is part of your land. How beautiful. It's magnificent, really beautiful. This Hong Kong-based businessman is eyeing an 800-hectare area here for hotels, retail and leisure centers. If I understand correctly, the Chinese absolutely need to have an infrastructure that allows them to have fun, spend money and buy souvenirs as well as food and drink. The price tag? More than a billion euros. This would be the largest scale project ever in the history of Kamchatka or anywhere in the Far East. The stakes for us are very high. It's a pioneer project. Yes, crucial in terms of its importance to the sector's development. The hope is that this project will attract other investors in turn. The lack of infrastructure has so far been a turn-off, though. But the Russian state is offering mouth-watering incentives, near total tax exemption for five years, and not only that. The Far East Development Corporation, using public money, will connect them to the electricity grid and to thermal water sources. Land belonging to the state is being made available in record time, at tiny prices compared to the market rates for land sales and rental here. But still, the investor is hesitating. Out of 55 billion euros in state-aided investments announced in the Far East, only 16 percent have so far been carried out. And the region is losing 17,000 inhabitants each year on average. Another state plan aims to reverse the exodus. This is my trusty steed. I've driven more than 10,000 kilometers in this car, all the way from Moscow. I had a trailer with my things in it. When I got here, there was nothing, just nature. Maxim is a geographer. He left his job in the capital to take advantage of a program offering one free hectare of land in the Far East to any Russian citizen. This is where my first building will be. I'm planning to build a house for guests. But first I have to clear the forest. And to cut down all these trees, I have to pay huge sums of money. As much as 30 euros per tree, in fact. That's the rate set by the municipal authorities in accordance with established forestry laws. And there are no exceptions for Maxime, nor for other participants in the programme in this area. Yeah. 
I asked the officials in charge of the land distribution program about this before I took the site. Everyone told me, no problem, cut the trees down, use the land. But when I arrived, I found myself having to pay two to four thousand rubles per tree. I don't plan to make money by chopping wood, but I can't start my project while this forest is in the way, and no one wants to solve the problem. While the state hands out unusable land by the hectare, others are making big profits from deforestation. 4,500,000 cubic meters of wood are chopped down each year in Vladivostok region alone. Big business. But it's actually an obstacle to development. This train over there, loaded with wood, is going to China. The logs are on open carriages, but the pre-cut planks are enclosed ones. Oleg Kuchma is a lawyer specializing in land rights. He is among those protesting the fact that 90% of cut wood from this region is exported to China. Legally, on paper, this wood still belongs to a Russian company, but de facto, it's already been bought by the Chinese. Obviously, if we use this wood to make furniture, house kits, paper, or all kinds of other things, its value would be multiplied tenfold. But we just sell it as raw material and thereby serve Chinese industry. So why would the Chinese invest in Russia when they're doing just fine milking us for our raw materials? There are barely any wood treatment plants in the Far East. But among Oleg's clients is one that's just about to open. DNS Les will be the region's first wood and slats factory. The boss, Nikita Timohodsev, is just making a few final checks. The least we can say is that the government's attempts to popularize the Far East have boosted both property prices and investor appetites in this sector. And the lack of competition means there are really good prospects for those who are not afraid to try and develop something here. But there's a problem. Timohodsev can't get the state to give him the 120,000 cubic meters of wood he needs for his production. He has to buy it, and at inflated prices because of the demand from China. We started buying wood a year ago, bearing in mind that the logging companies sell most of their produce to China at prices that are double or even triple the average on the Russian market. In a year, we managed to stockpile 10,000 cubic meters of wood. 10,000 cubic meters will be just enough to keep the factory running for a month and a half. Afterwards, it will have to stop for lack of raw materials. We're the only investor investor in the Far East that's not just making promises on paper, with numbers and non-existent factories. We've actually built a plant and invested a billion rubles. Assuming it can get the wood supply it needs, this factory will operate tax-free for five years, like most new investments in the region. Notwithstanding the various hiccups, the Russian state is lavishing ever more money on the Far East. It plans to invest 4 billion 700 million rubles by 2022. Because for Vladimir Putin, developing the Far East is the priority for the 21st century. Our reporter, Elena Voloshin, is still with us. Elena, thank you for that fascinating insight into to Russia's Far East. Um, in spite of all the money that's been invested, um, it doesn't appear to be working that well. What's going wrong? So there are uh, several problems. There is the lack of infrastructure, that's what we have tried to show, uh, but also there is a strong problem of governance. This is what happened to Maxime. Uh, the state has tell him, told him that he can go there uh, 
cut the forest, but when he arrived, the local bureaucracy has prevented him from doing what he wanted. And same thing with uh, this uh, plant uh, which wants to transform wood. There is a dark story of bribes asked uh, for this plant to uh, give them uh, some land uh, for their production. Uh, and it's a story which they are not very willing to talk about. Um, this leads to some situations, as you can see now on the screen. This is what should have been a center for culture and innovation, and it should have been achieved in 2016. But because a problem of budget, because the bureaucracy problems, it has never been. And he, it will remain like that for years now. And of course, a big spending of public money. So, Elena, tell us more about how Vladimir Putin sees the future. Well, um, everyone has his own dream for the Far East in the future. I don't know what is Vladimir Putin's one, but I've been talking to people who see Kamchatka as the future Iceland for tourism in volcanoes. Also, some people who uh, dream uh, the Far East as the uh, Canadian model with uh, very vast uh, and beautiful wild uh, lands, but also a strong and attractive economy. Actually, uh, there is a gap between the ambitions and what is, can really be made, but maybe this uh, very megalomania can help Russia to achieve its goals. The uh, people who are in charge of the project, they keep on rewriting, recalculating the budgets and uh, all the thing is for Russia not to run out of uh, the budget before uh, it can achieve anything. So Elena, I suppose Chinese investment uh, must turn out to be quite important. Yes, China is the leader in the troika of foreign investments in the Far East, uh, right before South Korea and Japan. But Chinese investments are far from being as uh, huge and massive as we can expect. Uh, actually, only 66 million of euros of uh, Chinese money have been invested in the Far East. And uh, despite uh, the fact that Vladimir Putin at the geopolitical scene uh, has uh, been turned to Asia, uh, but uh, economic he is looking forward to attract any foreign investments, including the Western ones, despite his confrontation with the West, uh, because we have seen that it's all uh, it's uh, everything but being easy to attract uh, foreign investors uh, to be the new pioneers in the Far East. Indeed, and this has to be managed well to make sure that the uh, infrastructure, the landscape, the wildlife are all preserved. Elena Volashin, thank you very much for your fascinating insight and report. See it again, of course, via our website, www.france24.com. This is Reporters on France 24. Stay with us.